Everyone, welcome to the Stay A Wild Table. I am your host, Tommy Vincent, and today we have joining us at the table, the lovely Dr. Bernice King. (laughs) And um, this conversation is going to be filled with so many gems and so many nuggets. So I just want to encourage you right now as you're listening that you make sure you take mental notes or you have your notebook and your pen ready so that you can write these things down so that they can add to some keys for your life so that you're able to find success and legacy where you are. So Dr. King, before we get into the main course of our conversation, I want to talk in a segment that is titled Food is Love. And as you know, I am a chef. And for me, I'm Master all about chef. legacy and <laughs> <laughs> I am all about legacy inspired cooking. So everything that I prepare, there's always a connection to someone in my life that has poured love into my soul. Mm-hmm. And so my first question for you is what food best describes your personality and why? You're asking questions I've never thought about. <laughs> wow. Jeez. What food best describes my personality and why? Mm. Mm. That's a good question. Uh... I'm trying to think of a food that is kind of, because this is the way I think uh, people perceive me and may be even the way that I carry myself, which may not be the best thing all the time, which is uh, there's this, and I don't want to use the word tough, but strength is a better word on the outside. But there's a there's there's a tenderness on the inside. So uh, you know, I don't know if there's a food that I can describe, but you know, every time um, I'm thinking of a food that uh, appears that way, but then when you chew on it, you, it's it's kind of like tender. So sometimes it has to do with how you cook the food too, like. Um, and I know this is not the direct way to answer this question, but my mother, and I don't eat beef today, but my mother used to make a mean pot roast. And, you know, they can look tough, you know, until you get it in your mouth. And some of them are because people don't know how to, how to, how to make them. <laughs> but when I tell you that that thing melted in your mouth when you put it in your mouth, that's exactly what it did. So I would kind of probably have, even though I don't eat beef today, but I did back then, I would have to say that's probably close to it. Uh, she looks like me, because people say, you look unapproachable, you look like this strong, you intimidate. It's, you know, I'm like, I don't, I don't get why, but, you know, uh, <laughs> but once people, once either I warm up, as they say to people, or people get to know me, they get in touch with that kind of soft, tender side. So mm-hmm. I hope that was the that was a good way to answer it. <laughs> I had to yeah, no, that, that was that was a perfect <laughs> description. That was the perfect description because as you were talking, in my mind, what I was thinking, okay, that sounds like definitely sounds like a protein. You know, something that we definitely need in our body. And then I thought of a steak. And then when you said the pot roast, I said, yep, that's just exactly what it is. Um, but that was a perfect description. Um, name one recipe that is special to you and why? Um, wow. One recipe. Now, you know, I'm not a cook. (laughs) So, You, 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 you're trying to reach for something real deep. I have cooked, but I'm not a cook, if that makes any sense. I mean, I, you know, I 
I, I do pretty well when I do, but uh, ah, Lord, I mean, you're asking these questions I had never thought about in terms of food. Um, do you all have a recipe in your family? Maybe it's not something that you cook, but a recipe that kind of circulates throughout your family when it hits the table that everybody is like, oh, this is such and such is you whatever know, I it is. I, I, we, you know, we, the, the thing is, we love food. So I don't think there's an affinity to anything in particular because people always ask me, what's my favorite food? And honestly, I don't really have one. I mean, that I know that sounds mm-hmm. strange, um, but I, I really don't have one. I can talk about, I don't have the really, I don't have the recipe of something that, I'm going back to my mom again, because she, as you said, she is so significant or was so significant in my life, but she still is very significant, um, even in her absence. Um, but um, she used to make this vegetable soup. And when I tell you it was a staple in our home for anybody who ever came to our home, it was it was so good. And, and we used to get those Ritz crackers and kind of put them inside the soup. You know how you do that? You know, um, yes, and get them uh, nice and soft. And soft <laughs> and yes, yes, it made the soup even better. But she would pull together all these different vegetables um, that are left over and all of that kind of stuff and put inside the soup. And she would freeze it. She kept uh, those old uh, containers, you know, the tall ones, mm-hmm. uh, plastic containers. She would freeze them and put them put them away and literally there are people that will talk about that soup today that if you weren't feeling well, she would offer you that soup and people literally felt better. I mean, there are people that tell stories of that soup who come to my mom's house. Anybody who ever came to visit or to meet with her got some of that soup. And so if I had to talk about one thing, it would be that the problem is nobody asked for the recipe before she died. Mm-hmm. And so I've not tasted soup, vegetable soup like that since. I'm not saying it's not, none exists, uh, but that was a staple for a long time in my life. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately today I can't eat tomatoes, so I wouldn't be able to eat it. Um, but that would probably be, probably be, you know, a, a favorite that I can think of. And then something else is so simple. My aunt, my dad's uh, sister, who's still living, she's 94. Um, mm-hmm. She used to, I used to stay with them from time to time when my mother would travel because her daughter is just um, a year younger than I am. And uh, on Sunday mornings, even Saturday mornings, uh, not, not, well, not Sunday mornings, when we would have family uh, dinners that included all the families, she made what we call the Ferris juice. And the Ferris juice was a combination of frozen lemonade, frozen limeade, and frozen uh, grape juice. I used to love, Mm. you know, people love Uh, (laughs) Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid had nothing on this Ferris Ferris juice. I'm telling you, it was out of this world. And we talk about it now because, you know, she's not in uh, in a state where she can fix it today. But, you know, I think I'm going to try to do that. I might try to think about doing that at Thanksgiving. I'm glad you asked me that mm-hmm. question because somebody got to bring it back. Um, but it was everybody loved that Ferris juice, I'm telling you. I think about, you know, definitely recipes, written recipes were not passed along to me. However, you know, I really just believe that when we are able to bring recipes forward from our ancestors, it presents an opportunity for this generation and generations to come to have an opportunity to engage with their great, great, great grandmother. You know, it's like you're keeping, you you're keeping them alive through the food so they can experience the love um, that was in those dishes. And so while I didn't have recipes from my grandmothers um, or even my parents, they 
because everybody was a dump cook, they would just make a dish. There were no put a cup of this or a teaspoon of that. And so I go off of one, how it made me feel, you know, the experience that the food brought to me and then just memory and seeing, I know she put this in it. I know they put that in it. And then just taste and visually just wanting those dishes to come back to life. And, you know, I've been, um, I've been successful at some and then other ones I've made it my version, but the love behind it is still comes from that place of something that I experienced growing up with all of my, you know, the people who fed me throughout my life. And that's what's important is the love that goes into the food with the taste. Because I think there's some people that put (laughs) love into their food, but Lord have mercy on that taste. I got a story about that because a couple of stories real quick. One Thanksgiving, uh, we went to visit my mother's sister. She started saying she was dying. and She really wasn't. I think she just wanted some attention. And it was Thanksgiving time. And, you know, we're used to eating, you know, a Thanksgiving meal that's out of this world uh, in terms of taste. And so we went to visit her in um, um, Pennsylvania, Westchester. And uh, my mother forgot it's Thanksgiving, you know, because we were just all in the moment of the crises. So we decided, okay, how are we going to get food? And my aunt talked about this woman friend of hers could, you know, fix us something. When we got that food, Tommy, Lord, have mercy. (laughs) That was the first time in my life that I understood the power of seasoning because that food had (laughs) zero. I had never tasted chicken so horrible oh my god you know nothing the only thing that had a little bit of taste because it comes with that is were the yams that was it i i said oh my god so on the flip side when people used to ask and bernie's cook and that's why i hate this is one of the reasons not the major reason i hate my mother's not here today she will she would always say to people Bernice is a good cook. Uh, even though I'm, I don't consider myself a cook, I didn't do it often, but there were times when I did. I did large family gatherings. In fact, that's how I started. Uh, she said because she knows how to season. She seasons well. Mm. She said that's the key to cooking is knowing how to season those foods. And I think about that so often when I'm eating foods, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tasting, where's can I taste, you know, the different whatever herbs and spices. Mm-hmm. Um, but some people just don't know how to bring that stuff to life. You know, and it, the, the food is either bland, um, because even like if you if you season and don't have a lot of sodium, you know, salt content, um, it, it, you 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 really gotta know how to mix and blend those those herbs and spices. Because otherwise, it's like it may look good, but it just it doesn't have the taste. Yeah, it'll and fall. So, it'll fall yeah, flat for sure. Yeah, yeah. So my mother used to she used to throw down. She was a great cook, and she she taught me the power of seasoning. She was the one who really taught. But I never understood when she would say, "You put a pinch." What is a pinch? I mean, I know you can pinch, <laughs> but what is that? Two pinches? <laughs> like what is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm used to a tablespoon, a quarter of a tablespoon, you know, an eighth of a tablespoon. You know, I can get with that. But a, pinch, a pinch of this, about two pinches of that. <laughs> Lord, that must but they know how they know do they know how to throw they knew how to throw down with their pinches. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, 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 Lord. Name a time in your life when food was healing for you. Wow. Healing. Oh my God. That usually the opposite is that food is uh is what we resort to when we're stressed out. Um hmm. where do you get these questions? 
<laughs> Lord have mercy. Um, you know, it, I, I, I would have to say and these are not the traditional answers, but I would have to say those times when my mom would come over to my house when I was not feeling well, mm-hmm. and she would go in that kitchen and and whip some 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 kind of soup concoction up uh, and bring it to me, you know, uh, because it was mom. Uh, I think it just. It, the, the the her pr- knowing how busy my mother was um and this was in, in my adult years i'm not talking about when i was a little kid i'm talking about in my adult years in my 20s late 20s early 30s she she, she would come to my come to my house and she would get in that kitchen and bring something to me and it just it was very soothing cuz it was from mother it was the love it was the care, the compassion, and the sacrifice, you know, because as a grown person, your your parent doesn't have to come see you unless it's something great. It should, they don't have to come see you when you, you're you not feeling, you know, some kind of respiratory, you know, illness or whatever. Uh, they got you, you know, in the bed a couple of three days, but she did it. And it made all mm-hmm. the difference in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... um. I appreciate those lessons. Um, And that's why I always think it's so important for us to, I just was having this conversation with um, one of my sons. It's so important for us to keep people in our life that are more seasoned than us, Mm -hmm. because there are some things about being, learning how to be, a good human that comes along with being able to glean from the wisdom of people who've lived life longer than you have. And when we lose those connections and we don't continue to pass along how to live a life that's full of love, then it doesn't keep getting passed along. And so I encourage all of my kids, no, you need to make sure that you have people in your life that are more seasoned than you, that have lived longer than you, so that you can grab a hold to and catch on to the things that they learned throughout their life that has allowed them to be who they are today and has contributed to the development of who they are. Um, So I think that that is um, the story and just even how you illustrated in that story, you were grown and your mom was doing these things for you, but you recognized in that moment that not only was she bringing her love, but she was sacrificing because her, she herself was a grown woman who had grown woman responsibilities, but yet she, it was a part of her understanding this piece of me is important because this is going to bring about the nurturing and the healing that Bernice will need. Um, so I, I love that illustration and, and the way that you painted that picture. Yeah, thank you for that. Let's get into the main course of our conversation. And I want to start it with this quote. The quote says, my story is a freedom song of struggle. It is about finding one's purpose, how to overcome fear, and to stand up for courses bigger than oneself. And that is a quote from the late Coretta Scott King. And we are going to be talking about today, uh, and the title of this actually came from you, Dr. King, Sometimes the King is a Woman. Building and continuing family legacy while developing your individual purpose. And, you know, I really had an opportunity to really think about our conversation. And and I shared with you before we started just how inspiring you are to me. And it kind of goes back to that last answer you gave regarding your mom. 
how you have such a reverence for her and how she poured into you for who you are today and recognizing that she was anointed. And so there's the the aspects of her that you had the opportunity to sit under and for that oil to run down on you. And then in the process, you too were being cultivated and curated by God to be the woman that you are today. And I just truly believe that that is a component in life that women need today. Just recognizing and understanding that in order for us to be and to become, that we have to be in position to receive someone else's oil so that we're able to walk in an anointing that is that has power in it. And so this is what this conversation for me embodies and being able to have this conversation with you. I just believe that this is going to just be a truly life changing, transformative conversation for everyone who has an opportunity to hear it. So the first question that I have for you is many people think they know you, but no one knows you better than you know yourself. So can you, Dr. Bernice King, define for us what you believe about your purpose? And at one, what point in your life did you recognize that, no, this is it. This is what I'm here to do. Wow. You know, I've, I, I've been uh, thinking about that holistically because there are a lot of things I could say, but my father had a sermon entitled Three Dimensions of a Complete Life. And he talked about the length, the breadth, and the depth. Um, um, And essentially what it was is it's a triangular. It's the, the love and reverence for God for self and for others. Um, And I have come to understand that for me, I'm on this earth to encourage and inspire people to live that, that those three dimensions. Um, I have a tendency to try to observe and listen to where people are and think about what may be missing or lacking or that needs, you know, uh, strengthening and focusing on that. Um, And and so for instance, if somebody is self-consumed and doesn't have any true outreach to others, in other words, they haven't understood uh, their responsibility to humanity. They don't grasp the importance of having um, uh, some type of other centeredness in their life. Then I try to, you know, encourage and inspire in that way. If there's somebody who's trying to gain the whole world and let yet lose their soul, you know, I try to get them mm-hmm. back to center to understand it's okay to have a healthy self-centered concern, you know, to take care of yourself. Because what you don't want to be is what my my pastor used to tell me. He said, don't be a public success and a private failure. So the things that you have Mm. to do personally and for self um, and keep a sense of balance because you can, um, you can, you can lose your mind. You can break down. um, You can shorten. I, I believe Sometimes people can become so, so other centered that they short circuit Mm -hmm. their life. And so even if they may have a longer life, the quality is compromised. So that's important. But then there's so many people who are so consumed in the day to day of the world and the responsibility of fulfilling that outward, you know, call. Um, they 
they have the balance of the self, but they don't connect with the greater power. They don't have a reverence and respect and a love for where God is situated in all of this. Um, mm-hmm. And so it depends, you know, on which angle I come. But the point is that I use what I have learned, what you said earlier from the wisdom and 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 the, the oil that my mother um, poured into my life and my father, in, in a sense, um, to try to, to encourage and inspire people that way. So if we're talking about other concerns, we're talking about the world and everything that we're looking at, you know, I approach it with the teachings that my both my father and mother uh, left for all of us um, that we call Kenyan nonviolence in the King Center. We've kind of branded it as nonviolence 365 and teaching people how to really engage humanity from a nonviolent perspective. You know, how do we transform mm-hmm. our society for the better? Because we, we, we can't do it in, in ways that are destructive. Um, because at the end of the day, we're all connected, you know, and interconnected. Uh, and we've got to find a way to, to coexist uh, in this world and ensure that there is justice and equity and fairness um, and dignity and, and respect. Um, and so, you know, the, I discovered this fully probably when I got to the King Center. The King Center has been like the unveiling for me of a lot of things. And it may have been because I finally got to a position uh, of responsibility where, you know, it really matters now. You know, I, I from a day-to-day mm-hmm. perspective, I'm responsible for the people that work with me. I'm responsible, you know, to the public because I'm leading a charitable organization. I'm responsible to my parents' legacy because it is their institutional legacy uh, that I represent. Um, and ultimately, you know, I have to be accountable to God, you know, on a day-to-day basis. That's that's what that's what drives me in everything that I do is the accountability to Him. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, can you share with us what you learned from your mother about being a woman? You know, when I when I thought about that, I I you know I'm not I'm not sure if I fully understand that question. But what I can say, um, because I'm a woman who um, was developed educationally in two um, arenas that are predominant have been historically predominantly male dominated ministry uh, and law. Uh, and what really gave me a sense of grounding and security is watching my mother, you know, not be drawn into other people's hangups about her being a woman leading and influencing uh, mm-hmm. change. Uh, you know, she didn't wear, she didn't wear the, the, the weight of the world on, on her in terms of you're just a woman. You know, a woman can't do this mm-hmm. and can't do that. My mother wore her purpose, you know, on her. She That's what she carried with her every day. And she stayed focused in that. And whatever people had to say about her being a woman, and even when she started out, they said, you know, you need to stay at home and raise your four kids. She knew she had a greater call in her life. And so in spite of what they were saying, and in spite of how they treated her as a woman a lot of times, trying to leave her out of this or not give her her due, she just kept staying focused, you know, on her purpose, mm-hmm. on her assignment. Um, and it helped me. So when I got, when I finally accepted my call to ministry and, and did that first outward thing that you do, which is a sermon, um, um, I had an opportunity to preach at a lot of different churches. And, you know, there were a few you know, that, that 
you know, struggled. Some of the people in their congregation struggled with women preachers. And, you know, and when I became a preacher, in at least in my tradition, the Baptist church, um, and it's not a Southern Baptist, but even the Black Baptist church, you didn't see or hear of many women preachers. I mean, I probably was, especially at my age, I was a novelty. There's a lot of women now um, at young ages. But when I was coming along, when I got my call, I was, uh, what, I was 17. That was about 1980. So it wasn't a oh, lot. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's when I got the call. Now I ran for eight years. Um, so you're talking about right around 87, 88. There weren't a lot of women out there mm-hmm. that, that were 20 years old preaching. <laughs> um, and I remember, I remember distinctly people saying, a woman not, uh, I, there was a guy that was working for the king said, a woman, I suffer not a woman to preach or to teach, assert, 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 exert <laughs> authority over a man. And, you know, initially, you, you, you know, you, you, you have this reaction where you want to go back and forth with that person. But I just, I just drew from the strength of my mother. She didn't get in those kind of conversations. Did not get in the back and forth. That's their issue. That's their hang up. <laughs> you know, I'm going to let you sit mm-hmm. with that. I'm getting ready to keep doing what I'm doing. And that's what I did. So I didn't carry the same anger in ministry that sometimes I see women carry. And I get it. You know, not being acknowledged, not being respected, you know, not given the opportunity and all that kind of stuff. I just did what I needed to do wherever I needed to do it. And my gifts made room for me, you know. And one day I was at a church and the chair of the deacon board said, you know, I, I just, I ain't, I didn't believe in, in women preachers, but you you changed my mind on today. <laughs> and so that was <laughs> me like a confirmation that, hey, you know, yeah, if you just, if you just stay focused, it may take some time, you know, and I, I get it. We should be at a place in this world and race and sexism, all this stuff, mm-hmm. where people, you know, regard your humanity, your giftedness, your the fact that God created you just as equal as they are, and that you bring something to this world. But we're not fully there yet. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get, uh, I'm not gonna let it wear me down. Let me just say that. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna address it. We're going to continue to challenge it. But while we're doing that, I'm also going to keep doing what I'm doing. You're not going to stop me from doing what I'm doing. This is what I was called to do because my accountability is to God, not to man, not to woman, not to anyone. It is to God and God alone. Mm -hmm. So my final question for you is, um, could you speak to the women that are listening to our podcast and, and, uh, we don't discriminate men listen to, but this is specifically for them and fellas get to listen. You talked about, you know, how you have such a, you're flat footed in who you are and what you know that God has purposed you to do. And you're not moving from that. So no matter what people are saying, no matter the discouragement or, you know, people trying to reject that aspect of who you are, you're committed to do it, to doing it anyway, because you know that you, your calling has been established to you by God. Yes, you, you were born into a family where there's a mantle that sits heavy on the entire family, but you are establishing your legacy in the earth for the glory of God. What would you share with other women who are positioning themselves to really get into identifying why am I here and what have I been called to do and being steadfast and getting that done before they leave this earth? What would you say to them? Well, the the first thing, just as a point of clarification, because this has been something I've wrestled with. Uh, for the last few years and got greater clarity during the pandemic. In my particular situation, I was born into something that had started. Um, 
in, in my family. And for a long time, people were trying to get me to figure out what Bernice, what is what is your legacy? And I had to come to the conclusion that I'm not creating a legacy. I'm I'm building upon a legacy because it's a legacy that mm. this world continues to need. And so I'm now mm-hmm. saying, what is it that I am supposed, what, what brick am I supposed to add? What element am I supposed to, you know, add uh, to the equation? And asking that critical question. And as I was talking to my stylist yesterday, um, you know, we were talking about um, the, the work of the, the King Center and uh, my father and mother's legacy. And I said, I don't know if it's my, I don't know if it's my stylist. I was talking to somebody else and I was on the phone. I can't remember, but I was saying, you know what? At the end of the day, for those that are in Christ, even with my father's legacy, when you peel back, he's really carrying, he was really carrying a dimension of the legacy of Christ. Um, So it all ties back to that. It ties back to, you know, what is my contribution to building, continuing to build the kingdom of God in the earth? Dr. King's contribution was to introduce us to a philosophy and methodology of nonviolence as a way to bring about social transformation, giving us the, the foundation of principles that you must abide by why you carry out the strategy and why you carry out, you know, the steps of nonviolence. Um, and for me, what I've discovered is how do we now do what daddy challenged that he didn't get a chance to further explore or exemplify to the world. Uh, and my mother who created an institution uh, that kind of institutionalized all this, but she didn't get a chance to really develop um, a, a, a nation of people within nations who embraced this way of living on a day-to-day basis. You know, I think our world falls apart because as we evolve, there's some things that don't stay constant, that need to stay constant. That You know, there it's, it's kind of like, Gravity is gravity. It's not going to ever change. Now, you might manipulate some things, but it's still going to be gravity. There, there's some principles that come out of the heart and spirit of God and Christ around love that you cannot, you can't change. Love is never going to be out distance or out one. In the end, it's mm-hmm. going to prevail, whether we like it or not. It's going to prevail and everything else will eventually dissipate. But we have to stay consistent in that on a day to day basis, a day to day work to allow love to be exuded in your interactions, in your, you know, ways of thinking through decisions that impact people's lives, Mm -hmm. whether we are inventing something, Mm -hmm. creating something, setting policies, making decisions for an entire company of people, you know, how do I ensure that the outcome of this leaves people with with their dignity, that people feel that they uh, are in an environment that they belong, that there's fairness, that there's equity, um, you know, that, that it's it's the beloved community, we call it. I would mm-hmm. flip that and say the, the kingdom of God. And so for me, it's, hey, um, my contribution is to get people to that place where they're living this. So the question that people have to ask themselves is, what seems to be missing, lacking in the world that gets your attention as a woman? What, what is it? That, what is that stirring up in you that you always find yourself trying to step to and, 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 and address or pay attention to, you know, um, and do something about? You know, and, and, and what continues to draw you, whether you end up like every time you turn around, 
you're coming back to the same thing. It keeps showing up over and over and over again. That to me is mm-hmm. where you find your sense of purpose and peace. You know, that's your piece of this entire equation of getting the 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 world to where God wants us all to be holistically. Um, so I take the weight because I, you know. I think when we push too many people to have all these individual leg- legacies, what happens? Because who carries? What happens? Is it really a legacy at that point? Because once a person is gone, if if it's nothing left behind, in other words, if, if we can't continue to carry that forward. So if I catch something from somebody else, I'm carrying that piece into another dimension. You know, so you got to find out what piece of that dimension are you supposed to carry into this generation and and leave for the next generation and now add the next piece? Mm. That was um that was powerful and um thank you for that. It is definitely something, you know, that we should all be considering and as you were talking what I just right now you are in the campaign of be love. And so when you were talking about that process, I was just seeing making sure that we're filtering all that we do through love and it will land us where we need to be in regards to ourselves and also the greater community at large. So I appreciate our conversation today. I appreciate you sharing, you know, just pieces of you, even from the intimate stories uh, from the food conversation where you brought us into the table and your family. I really appreciate you and I appreciate the work that you continue to do in the earth, carrying forward the legacy, laying the bricks for the dimension that you've been called to in the space with the legacy that your father started and your mother continued to develop. And now here you are doing your part in the process. So I appreciate you. And I thank you so much for joining me today at the Stay A While podcast table. Thank you so much for having me. And maybe we'll do this again. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime. Come on and stay a while.